Hi, good afternoon. This is Michelle Condi and Laura Harker. Thank you for joining us for changes in healthcare and policy in the 2019 Georgia legislative session. Uh, so we're about to begin. We hope everyone has been able to find the right section on our Facebook page. If not, this will be available for you all to watch and catch up later. So let's get started. During this presentation, we will be going over this year's little and big budget, past bills, study committees, bills that did not pass, and any missed opportunities that we saw in the legislative session, as well as providing you all with some resources. So at Georgians for a Healthy Future, we have a three-pronged approach that we used that includes outreach, education, and engagement with consumers and communities, building and mobilizing coalitions, and public policy advocacy. So we connect healthcare consumers with these skills in order to change policy in the state and build a healthier Georgia. And this is Laura Harker with the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, where I serve as the health policy analyst. And we are excited to join today to talk about the health budget, which is my focus. But as an organization, we focus broadly on looking at how the state spends its dollars and how to best encourage economic opportunity across the state for all Georgians. And we use that research to inform the legislative process. So we all definitely predicted a big year in Georgia's healthcare landscape and GHF is here to make sure things are being taken care of and see what we can do for the consumer. These were our 2019 policy priorities to increase the number of Georgians with health insurance, stabilize Georgia's health insurance marketplace, ensure access to care and financial protections for consumers purchasing private health insurance, set and enforce standards that provide for equitable coverage of mental health and substance use treatment services by health plans, prevent nicotine use and addiction by young Georgians, and to support partners in integrating health and equity in the policies across every sector to address social determinants of health that prevent equitable access to care and equitable health status. So let's just take a look at Georgia's healthcare policy, healthcare policy environment this year. Right now we have a Republican governor, a Republican majority in the Senate and the House, a struggling rural hospital system, and our overall approach to healthcare in past years has been pretty hands off, but this year we saw a lot of action, a lot of attention being brought to healthcare with the demand for change being brought on by the public and consumers like you. Georgia unfortunately still has poor state health outcomes. Uh, in the last report from America's Health Rankings, we still ranked 41. Um, so um, this chart is pretty difficult to read, but as you will see, there's um, we can send a link as well. But this bill shows kind of how complicated it can be to pass a bill in the legislature, but it, it goes through a really streamlined process of making sure that both chambers are able to weigh in on bills um, as well as um, advocates are able to attend committee meetings to provide input as well as um, at the actual floor vote. There's opportunities throughout. Um, really the best time for you to get involved in talking to your legislators is outside of the session period. Um, so session ended in April, beginning of April. So really from now until the next session begins in January, there's time to contact your legislators to talk to them about issues you care about to make sure that they are aware and can look at filing bills for next session or make sure they know how you would like them to vote in um, future sessions. And the biggest bill that has passed each year is the budget. Um, that is the main priority for the legislature. Yes, next slide. Um, so the budget includes the big budget and the little budget. So starting with the big budget for this year, that is the fiscal year 2020 budget. And I'll focus on the healthcare yes, agencies. And this budget starts in July of this year and will go to June 30th of 2020. So all the budgets are named for the year that they end. Looking at the budget overall, so we had about a $26 billion general fund budget for the year. So most of that is K-12 education, as you can see here. But healthcare is a, the second largest component of the state's budget. And that's about 20% of the total budget. And it really mostly includes Medicaid, but also some important services for behavioral health, as well as public health prevention services. 
So just zooming in on that $5 billion health agency budget within that includes the Department of Community Health, which is $3.6 billion. That's largely Medicaid. And I'll go over some of these agencies in more detail in the next slide. The second largest health agency is the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, and that's $1.2 billion, and that's been growing as there has been an increased need for substance abuse treatment and mental health treatment. And with a public health budget, it's the smallest of the health budgets, um, but very important for prevention, including um, HIV prevention, um, vaccinations, and other important services across the state. That's about $292 million for that budget in state funds. So a little bit more about each of these agencies and their role. This outlines that Department of Community Health is responsible for Medicaid, which is the program for low income people in the state. And Peach Care is another program that's focused on lower income children and lower and moderate income children. But also the Department of Community Health manages the state health benefit plan, which serves teachers and state employees and those employees pay into that plan. So it's not part of the budget for the agency, but they do oversee the money that comes in from the employees and the employers. And also the Department of Community Health is responsible for a lot of the regulation of our healthcare system, including certificate of need and other hospital regulations that are um, under their supervision. Um, the largest um, part of DCH is really covering Georgians. So about one in four Georgians are covered by either Medicaid, Peach Care, or the state health benefit plan. And half of the dollars that we receive from the federal government are going into the Medicaid program. So all the um, importance of federal funding in the state budget, healthcare is really one of the biggest, most important pieces of our federal funding that we receive. Uh, the second agency, Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, um, that agency was founded in, after a settlement with the Department of Justice, and that required the state to increase our home and community-based services for people with in intellectual and developmental disabilities. So prior to this point, a lot of those patients were treated inside of institutions and hospitals. And so moving out of those institutions and into the community was really the charge that the state was given. And so we've seen a lot more services funded, including supported housing and needs within your home and within your community <clears throat> and providing support and treatment for people with behavioral health concerns. And lastly, the Department of Public Health, it operates programs that focus on disease prevention, as well as emergency preparedness, which is important with um, some of the hurricanes and natural disasters and preparing for those, um, as well as uh, just looking at overall health promotion programs um, around areas of concern like infant and child health, uh, maternal health. And most of the funds for the Department of Public Health are really going into the local county health departments to give them funds to offer services in their their communities. So to go into a little bit of the big budget, some notable highlights that I pulled out, and you can let me know if you have any questions about these at the end, but the Department of Community Health had a $3.6 billion total budget this year, which increased from last year. The biggest increase was with Medicaid and Peach Care, largely to replace federal funds. Um, because each year the federal government sets a formula that determines how much money we get to help us pay for Medicaid and peach care. Um, and that formula changed as our state has been growing and, and economically improving. The income in our state has gone up. So as a result, the federal government has reduced their matching rate. So we've had to replace some of those funds, uh, about 96 million to replace that as well as just some general needs that are occurring within the Medicaid program, as far as increased enrollment, increased healthcare costs, that's contributed to some $56 million in projected need. Also the next big pieces were some of the costs around Medicare Part B. So Medicaid is for low income Georgians. Medicare is the program for people over the age of 65 and it's a federal program but some of Georgians are able to qualify for both Medicaid and Medicare, and Medicaid is able to help pay for some of the premiums within Medicare for some of the older Georgians who have very low incomes, very low assets. 
So that was about a $7 million cost to help with that. And also $5 million to help with covering more gene therapy drugs. Some of the other big themes outside of Medicaid and Peach Care were nursing home support. So there was an increase of $13.7 million to help increase rates by 3% within nursing homes, um, as well as some additional support to enhance background checks and to increase the ventilator reimbursement rate as well as an increase by $5 in the personal needs allowance for people who live in nursing homes. So there was a lot of support in the budget to help continue to support nursing homes. And Medicaid is the payer for about 75% of our nursing home care. So any increase to help nursing homes is really an important role for Medicaid. Um, additionally, outside of that, there was some support for provider workforce. So the Department of Community Health also includes the physician, well now the Healthcare Workforce Board. And so they are able to fund some additional primary care residency slots this year, as well as OBGYN residency slots. Um, and that's important because some people, students who graduate from medical school here are not able to find residency slots to stay in the state. So continuing to increase those slots is an important piece of the budget this year. Um, additionally, there was some additional support for community health centers through startup grants for two new federally qualified health centers, that's FQHCs, one for primary care in Screven County and one in Chatham County, which will focus on behavioral health care. And lastly, some more on the issues that are prevalent throughout the budget. Maternal health has been a big conversation this year, and so within the Department of Community Health, there's also $500,000 for a center of excellence on maternal mortality, and that will be housed at the Morehouse School of Medicine. And within the, the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, the second largest agency, we see that the largest increase was really around increasing core services. So the services that are provided across the states in the community service boards that are around and providing services mostly to the uninsured, but also to patients on Medicaid and some private insurance. So those are core services across the state that we're making a large investment in this year, as well as increasing some of the inpatient services. So for people who need to stay overnight and need bed capacity and crisis beds, especially in situations um, with law enforcement not knowing where to send people in a crisis situation, having more beds is very necessary. So $7.7 .7 million is added to help with that across the state. Also, another important addition was $5 million to increase residential treatment, and that's mostly focused on substance abuse. Also, some supported housing is a, a big theme and requirement, really, of the department under the Department of Justice Settlement. And so $2.5 million was added for that. And that continues to be something added every year to comply with the terms of that settlement and to help people who um, are moving out of institutions and don't have a place to live, making sure they have housing that also is accompanied by services. Additionally, each year there's continual additions to the waivers that serve people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so in order to move out of the institutions and into the community, those folks require waivers and that allows them to get services in their home. So we were able to add 125 new slots this year to serve more people who need those services. Um, the last two big pieces were $500,000 to provide a, a more permanent supported housing, and this is focused in Fulton County through a public-private partnership. So that's a model that's been successful in other places, including Rome, Georgia, where they've been able to match public funds with private housing developers to develop supported that's housing for the homeless community and their respective regions. Um, so that's a successful model that we're continuing in the budget. And lastly, 250,000 was provided for Mercy Care to provide primary mental health care for the uninsured population. And lastly, the next largest agency, the third agency, Department of Public Health, there was quite an increase this year compared to last year, especially around maternal health and around some newborn screenings, cancer care, sickle cell. Um, those are really the main themes within the budget this year. 
So you can see the top 2.3 million for adding new screenings um, or new disorders to the newborn screening, 1 million for screening, referring, and treating maternal depression, focus on rural and underserved areas, and that's been a big topic within the maternal health discussion. Also, perinatal support sites are being supported in Jenkins, Randolph, and Wilcox counties, and $500,000 for county <laughs> health departments to provide feminine hygiene products to low-income clients. And there also, I should note, are, is $500,000 in the Department of Education budget also for providing feminine hygiene products to students. So a total of a million dollars for providing feminine hygiene products. And that was really in response to some of the efforts to eliminate the tax on feminine hygiene products. Um, so that bill did not move, but I think this is maybe a first step towards providing support um, to help women who cannot afford those products. And $300,000 was added for the regional cancer coalitions to help them continue to screen and prevent and coordinate care and navigation services. $200,000 in additional support for the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, which reviews the causes of maternal deaths so that we can prevent those deaths, as well as $150,000 for sickle cell outreach services in South Georgia. So the next is the amended budget. This is the little budget. So that's the budget that we're in right now until June 30th of this year. So there were some highlights there that I wanted to discuss. Um, there were some adjustments around Medicaid, 32.1 million. And this is very similar to the big budget. It was mostly related to federal funds changing, um, needs changing throughout the year. So just updates there um, that weren't too out of the norm. And then also $18.7 million to provide some additional support in disproportionate share hospital payments, which help private hospitals to account for the care that they're providing uninsured patients, the uncompensated care. So that helps them to cover some of those losses. Um, also, there was $9.3 million for Mercer University School of Medicine to establish a four-year medical school in Columbus, Georgia. Also $2 million for rural hospitals. This was one-time funding. And those were hospitals that were impacted by Hurricane Michael. So additional support was added there um, for the year. The last two, one of this is one of the biggest ones for us as we've been working on Medicaid waivers. This is $1.6 million in state funds, and this was matched with a million dollars in federal funds. And those funds will be used to hire an external consultant. And that consultant will be responsible for recommending ways that we can implement either a Medicaid or both a Medicaid waiver and a 1332 waiver. So um, those options will be presented. There has not been that we know of a consultant hired at the moment, but we continue to keep an eye on that. Um, and then the last piece is $495,000 to provide background checks. And that's a continue um, of the nursing home support to provide just more security for nursing home patients. Okay, and before we move on, I do wanna remind everyone that we will make some time for questions at the end. I know while we're talking about bills that passed, uh, a few questions might come up, so we like leave them in the comments or save them until the end, so they'll be the first ones that we can see. All right, so these are the bills that passed this session. Uh, HB 63, which was sponsored by Representative Sharon Cooper, uh, requiring uh, step therapy protocols be outlined and implemented in the health process. Step therapy is a requirement by some insurers that patients try a series of lower cost treatments before the insurer will cover the higher cost treatment prescribed by a patient's physician. And uh, so this was just, this bill was to request exceptions to that for certain situations where people might need a stronger medicine without going through the different trials. We were also extremely happy to see the passage of HB 83, uh, which would require a daily 30 minute recess for all students in grades K through five, unless they already had a physical education class or structured activity time in the day. Uh, we won't touch too much on certificate of need reform and there is more information on uh, GHF's website under the bills that we're tracking as well as on our blog for bills that we have followed. Uh, HB uh, 186 
was by Representative Ron Stevens, and it created a new category for general cancer hospitals as part of an agreement with the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, and which would allow more Georgia patients to be seen. So HP 197 is the establishment of a strategic integrated data system sponsored by Representative Katie Dempsey, and it allows uh, this uh, data system to be implemented through the Office of Planning and Budget, and the data system would capture uh, information about physical and mental health and social services being provided to Georgians across the state. Uh, we had a fantastic package of HIV treatment and prevention bills uh, this year as well. We're really excited about that. HB 217 by Representative Houston Gaines decriminalizes the act of working or volunteering for a syringe services program, and it's a step towards legalizing these uh, uh, needle exchange programs. So distributing clean hypodermic syringes and needles to people who use injection drugs um, like heroin, and it helps to prevent the spread of HIV and hepatitis C, and it does not increase the likelihood that people will newly take up injections and drug or drug use. HB 233 was the Pharmacy Anti-Steering and Transparency Act by Representative David Knight. It prohibits pharmacies from sharing patient data for commercial purposes, and it prohibits pharmacy benefit managers from steering patients to PBM-owned pharmacies. It also requires that pharmacies file an annual disclosure statement of uh, all their affiliates. HB 290 is also part of the HIV uh, treatment and prevention package that was passed this year, and it's uh, brought to us by Representative Sharon Cooper. It establishes a pilot program to provide pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP drug assistance or services to persons at risk of being infected with HIV. PrEP, if you are not familiar, is a medication taken by people who are HIV negative to reduce their risk for infection. This pilot program would provide PrEP to people in counties that have been identified by the Center of Disease and Prevention at, uh, that these people are at a risk for HIV outbreaks to do a high rate of opiate use and participants would receive regular HIV testing and related support services. We're very excited that we actually had a good amount of bills passed this year, so we have another second page of great bills that we're excited to talk about. So HB 321 is the Medicaid financing program, and it extends the sunset provision of the hospital provider fee for five years. The hospital payment program, which brings down extra federal funding, provides almost a billion dollars annually to our state's tight Medicaid budget. HB 323 is also another PBM or pharmacy benefits manager bill that passed this year. And it's a good, it's a great first step in drug transparency from pharmacy benefits managers. So PBMs will have to report how much they're receiving in rebates from pharmaceutical manufacturers to the Department of Insurance. Uh, they're not required to report this to the legislature or public, but like we said, it's a good first step. So Georgians for a Healthy Future is actually a part of the Healthy Housing Georgia Coalition. And as part of this coalition, we were extremely excited to see the packet passage of HB 346, which uh, would prevent retaliation by landlords against a tenant for complaining to court enforcement about unsafe or unhealthy housing conditions, like the presence of mold, radon, rodents, insect infestations, or lead. If the governor signs this bill into law, which we all obviously hope he will, Georgia will join the ranks of 41 other states that have already implemented similar legislation to protect tenants against retaliatory evictions. HB 514, which is the Georgia Mental Health Reform Innovation Commission, was also passed this year. And this, would, this commission will work to analyze and offer improvements to the state's mental health system. Georgia has taken a big initiative to try to improve mental health across the street. We're excited to see this continuing in this new administration. Uh, this uh, commission would last until June 30th, 2020, and there are several subcommittees within the commission. Unfortunately, there's not a consumer representative so far, but they would establish the child and adolescent mental health, involuntary commitment, hospital and short-term care facilities, mental health courts and corrections, and workforce and system development commission subcommittees. SB 16, sponsored by Senator Kate Kirkpatrick, would allow Georgian to enter the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, which allows healthcare providers to more easily obtain licenses so they can practice in multiple states. It also provides Georgia's medical board with easier access to investigate and disciplinary information about providers from other states, and it's an important measure 
uh, for Georgia patients. If you haven't heard of this last bill, we have a lot to talk about, and you really need to be following Georgians for a Healthy Future and GPBI a little more closely. SB 106 is the Patients First Act, which passed and has already been signed by Governor Kemp. So SB 106 allows for an 1115 waiver to extend Medicaid coverage to some adults, making up to 100% of the poverty federal poverty level. Now, this would help allow the um, state to apply for an 1115 waiver. There is so far no guarantee that it would be even up for 100% of the federal poverty, poverty level. GHF and our partners are requesting that the income had requested during the session that the income cap be lifted to 138% federal poverty level as is done under traditional Medicaid expansion as outlined in the ACA to no avail this year, unfortunately. Um, and that would have been helpful to cover more Georgians at a lower cost to the state. As currently written, SB 106 would leave out thousands of Georgians who are just above the poverty level and who would be covered under traditional Medicaid expansion or a broader 1115 waiver. SB 106 also allows the state to make dramatically, dramatically seismic changes to private health insurance in Georgia through 1332 state innovation wa waivers, which uh, bring about little accountability. Before we move on to bills that didn't pass, we're gonna take a quick look at study committees that were established this year. So we have five that we really wanna highlight. Uh, study committees, if you, uh, you're unfamiliar, are meet during the off session to take a closer look into specific policy issues and develop recommendations for the upcoming legislative session. So these committees have been appointed or selected to perform a specific task or study a specific issue. A Senate study commission, study committee examines various issues, reports as are released, which includes any findings, recommendations, or legislative proposals a committee deems appropriate. We have HR 421, which established the Joint Study Committee on Infant and Toddler Social and Emotional Health, which is uh, was amended, and so it's actually only uh, in the House. HB, HR 584, the House Study Committee on Exploring a Floor and Trade Charity Care System, House only. HR 589, the House Study Committee on Maternal Mortality, and it's also House only. Mater Georgia actually has the worst rate of maternal mortality in the country, so we're hopeful that this committee will be able to bring about results and reports that will be able to make some improvements throughout the state. HR 592 establishes the House Study Committee on Healthcare Reimbursement, it's House only again. And SR 202 and HR 261 are committees that will likely coordinate between the House and Senate, and they are the Senate Study Committee on Evaluating and Simplifying Physician Oversight of Physician Assistants and Advanced Practice Registered Nurses. So a little bit of a mouthful, but hopefully they'll be able to do a lot with that. So going up, moving on to bills that did not pass, Georgia did have some missed opportunities here with HB 37, the Expand Medicaid Now Act, which is sponsored by Representative Bob Trammell, um, our minority leader. Uh, and this would have brought about traditional Medicaid expansion as envisioned by the ACA, and it would have increased Medicaid eligibility for adults up to 138 of the federal poverty guidelines. Uh, this is equivalent to 17236 for dollars annually for an individual and about $29,435 for a family of three. HB 158 uh, is to improve Medicaid patient access to effective HIV treatment. Uh, just a little asterisk here, this bill did not pass, but it, it didn't get a Senate vote, but it received favorable comments in the Senate Health Committee after passing the House unanimously. So in recognition of the broad support of this effort, Georgia's Medicaid agency had committed to the bill sponsor to implement the intent of this legislation, which was to ensure that Medicaid recipients have the same access to antiretroviral drugs used to treat HIV and AIDS as to those included in the formerly established for the Georgia AIDS Drug Assistance Program. So HB 84, unfortunately, did not pass, and this is the increase transparency about risk of surprise out-of-network medical billing. Um, it was one of two bills that worked on surprise billing and to added transparency. This was from Representative Richard Smith, um, chair of the House Insurance Committee, 
and it was to increase transparency related to possible surprise medical bills. This bill would have set disclosure requirements for healthcare providers, insurers, and hospitals. This legislation would require the information on billing reimbursement and arbitration of services provided to the consumer at their request. Um, again, I do want to add that bills that did not pass this session do have a chance to come back next year. None of these bills are technically dead, so we there's a possibility that we will see a surprise out of network medical billing uh, legislation come back again next year in the form of these bills. SB 56 was the Consumer Coverage and Protection for Out of Network Medical Care Act, uh, sponsored by Senator Chuck Hofstetler, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, and it's to address surprise out of network medical out of network billing. Georgia has some of the narrowest networks in the country, so we do see a lot um, of issues with this particular uh, problem in the state. So this legislation would have disallowed surprise billing in emergency situations under insurance plans issued after July 1st, 2019. The bill contains similar transparency provisions to HB 84 and for consumers who receive elective medical care after which they receive a surprise bill greater than $1,000, the legislation would make available a mediation process through the Department of Insurance. SB 195 also did not pass and this is the Prescription Drug Benefits Freedom of Information and Consumer Protection Act. It was sponsored again by Senator Chuck Hostetler. This bill would have made it easier for consumers to know what prescription medications are covered by their health insurance plan and to have a better understanding of the likely cost by requiring health insurers to actually post prices on their website, information about their drug formulary in a current and searchable format. The drug formulary is the list of prescription medicines that your health insurer agrees to pay for or partially pay for. Okay, so missed opportunities and next steps. We are going to need all of you to pay close attention here because we will be needing a lot of support in the upcoming few months. There's a lot going on. I'm sure when I mentioned SB 106, it got a lot of people's attention. SB 106 is the patient's first act. What does H SB 106 do and what doesn't it do? What SB 106 does that we can confirm it actually does is allow the state to submit an 1115 waiver, including expanding coverage for people up to 100% of the February poverty level. It also allows the state to submit a 1332 state innovation waiver. That is all that we know about what the state can actually do with SB 106. What we know that it doesn't do is that it does not guarantee coverage for low-income Georgians. It does not seek the most cost-effective way to cover the most people, and it does not define the scope of changes to private insurance. So this allows the state to uh, submit an LM50 waiver that could be used to extend coverage to more low-income Georgians, but it doesn't guarantee for how many or for who exactly. And the 1332 state innovation waiver would make changes to Georgia's private health insurance marketplace, which we don't know what form this would come in. It would hopefully lower premiums, but we don't have any assurance by the administration of what exactly they plan to do with this. So ultimately, this would cause a seismic shift for healthcare in Georgia, could be good or bad, or it could result in Georgia decision makers just tinkering around the edges. What we can say is that we just don't know. So the risks of, that come with SB 106. At the worst, no more Georgians get covered. $135 million more to cover fewer. I know that statistics seems a little scary. Basically, what it means is that Georgia will be paying more to cover fewer people. Because SB 106 limits the a future of an 1115 Medicaid waiver to cover only adults making up to 100% of the federal poverty line, uh, which would be 12,490 for an individual and 21,330 for a family of three per year. This would cover 206, 267,000 more Georgians than are currently eligible for Medicaid in the state of Georgia, but the cutoff leaves out an estimated 190,000 uninsured Georgia adults who are making just more than the poverty level wages, which is 138%. These Georgians make up to 17,296 for an individual and 29,435 for a family of three. The Affordable Care Act envisioned that all adults making up to 138 FPL would be covered by Medicaid and provide states with an incentive to do so. 
States that extend coverage to these nearly eligible adults pay only 10% of the cost and the federal government picks up the rest in perpetuity. Georgia did not take this agreement. We, again, it's a big question mark, what comes next with these waivers, what exactly is going to be in them and what we can expect from the administration and what they submit and the answers they receive from uh, CMS. So the next steps are extremely important and we're going to be needing as much of the public to participate and take on what they can as possible. SB 106 has already been signed by the governor. This is the law. Georgia's Department of Community is going to hire, of community health will hire a consultant. The state will draft a waiver proposal and the public comment period comes. So we will be uh, giving out more materials. We'll provide this on our website, through our emails, through our social media pages. If you're not subscribed to our emails, please do so so you can be the first to know when this public comment period starts, what you should be saying, who you should be talking to, what kind of statement that you, our administration and the federal administration needs to hear from you in the state of Georgia to make sure that we're receiving the best deal possible for all Georgians. So DCH, DCH then responds to comments and then submits the waiver to the federal government. This also opens another public comment period. Again, it's when you tell your friends and family, to go. Sign up, hear the facts, tell DCH what, we need, what they need to know and what's gonna help Georgia make the biggest impact. Then the federal government will review these comments and negotiate with Georgia. Then the federal government either approves or rejects the waiver. And if it's approved, Georgia implements the waiver. These are steps for an 1115 waiver. And they're also pretty similar in a 1332 waiver for private insurance. There's not much of a difference. It's two, so we're going to end up having four public comment periods that we need as much of the public to participate in as possible. We will be providing as many facts, infographics, statements, uh, any guidance that you all may need as possible. If you tell us what you need, we will be there to provide the answers. So help us help, us help you here. <laughs> so here are some resources if you're unfamiliar. Join a coalition, share your story at healthyfutureGA.org under our Get Involved section. Your story makes the biggest impact. It puts a real life face to the issues in the state. Right now during our public comment period, we're gonna need as many stories as possible to be able to get out there, get the word out and let legislators know, elected officials know that there are real people facing real issues that can't afford to just sit around and wait. So we need you to take action now. We also need you to contact your legislators at CoverGeorgia.org. We have many facts, many lines, many talking points available there for you. You can contact us if there's anything specific that you would like to say that you want us to help you with. We are also available for you to invite us to present in your community and get your friends, family, neighbors, enemies, acquaintances, anyone you want involved. Here are some advocacy resources that are available. And Georgians for a Healthy Future is healthyfutureGA.org. We have the Georgia Health Action Network. Our Consumer Health Advocates Guide is available on our website. And our Facebook and Twitter handles are Healthy Future GA. And for Georgia Budget and Policy our Institute, our website, gbpi.org, as well as on Twitter, we are at GA Budget. And Facebook, we're also on there. So. So a few of the other advocacy resources that we want you to take advantage of are is Georgia Health News, which is georgiahealthnews.com. Stay up to date. Make sure you're getting the news that matters, things that are relevant, things that are coming up. We'll be focused on sharing some of these pieces with you as much as possible as well. Follow Georgia General Assembly at legis.ga.gov, Families USA at familiesusa.org, and Community Catalyst at communitycatalyst.org. Thank you so much for participating and we will actually be taking some questions now. We have an associate of ours from Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, Bentley Hudgens, who will be helping us out and letting us know what questions you may have. So we have a question. <coughs> Let me clear my throat. <laughs> How does Georgia compare to other states and healthcare expenditures? I can talk specifically around Medicaid um, as far as where we rank in how much money we spend per person on Medicaid. So we are near the bottom. Um, we, I think, are 
I'll have to get the exactly, but the number where we are now because it changes year to year, but we are near the bottom in terms of how much we spend per person on Medicaid. So it definitely suggests that considering our health outcomes in the state, as Michelle talked about, we rank 41st on America's health rankings. We have poor outcomes in maternal health and some other major pressing issues that suggest that we can have some room to spend more on healthcare and, and health coverage particularly. Um, and that's just on Medicaid. And when you look at public health, which is more of the prevention spending, we also are falling behind there. Uh, and I think a lot of states are falling behind since medical care is, and treatment has really been prioritized, but there's a lot more we can do to prevent people from getting sick in the first place. And so I think there's improvements to be made on, on all fronts in our healthcare spending. Um, but we're starting to see more on behavioral health spending over the past several years. And so that's something that is also a part of Georgia Budget and Policy Institute's priorities as part of our people powered prosperity agenda is increasing that behavioral health funding. So overall, we're not where we need to be, but there's still um, room for us to grow in our health spending. Thank you, Laura. We have another question. Um, is it a requirement to stay in Georgia to practice primary care and OBGYN care attached to funding from the state? There is funding, there's scholarships um, and loan payment, repayments um, through the Department of Community Health's Physician Workforce Board. Um, so those do require you to be in the state practicing and those typically are focused on rural communities, typically defined by having less than 35,000 people or 50,000 people, depending on the definition. Um, so those do require um, staying in the state. Um, there's also some OBGYN residency slot funding so that's training that is in schools within the state um, and so in the budget there were 54 new OBGYN slots and those include 36 slots at Emory University School of Medicine, 20 slots at Medical College of Georgia, 16 slots at Memorial University Medical Center, 16 slots at Morehouse School of Medicine, and 16 slots at Navicent Healthcare Macon. And so those slots will be, as long as they stay in the state, they'll be funded to train in their OBGYN practice at those schools. Um, but after those residency trainings are done, they'll be able to practice in other states if they choose, but hopefully we'll stay and practice in the state. But really the loan repayment and scholarship is the main way to ensure that we encourage people and incentivize providers to stay in the state. And uh, I saw that we have another question through our Facebook comments as well. So what does it mean when you state 100% of FPL as compared to 138% of the FPL? So FPL is the federal poverty level. Right now, SB 106 would cover, uh, the 1115 waiver would cover up to 100%, and that would be people making about 12,490 for an individual and 21,330 for a family of three per year. At 138, this would be 17,296 for an individual and 29,435 for a family of three. These are still very limited incomes. 100% uh, of the federal poverty level would generally, would hopefully be covered under the Medicaid wa waiver that's being submitted, but 138% is generally what is um, written out in the ACA as traditional Medicaid expansion because the this is still an income where people are surely trying to decide between buying groceries or making sure that they receive health coverage. Um, we don't have a any more questions, but there is a note from Lynn Snyder, a great partner of ours down in Macon, um, that feminine hygiene products refer to cleansing products but if we're talking about the whole thing, it should be menstrual products. And so something that they learned in their advocacy, but oh, hopefully we can, great to know. we can do moving forward. Um, does anybody have any more questions? We do have another from Dan Williams. Why are we spending so much on consultants to design a waiver if we already know what the state is proposing for an 1115 waiver? So I think the biggest answer to that is that we don't know exactly what the state is doing. Right now, what SB 106 says is, that we would be asking for up to 100% of FPL, meaning that it could be less. We also don't know what CMS will reply um, because if generally when states have requested for uh, lower than 138% as spelled out under the ACA, it's been rejected or the match has been less. We 
obviously would prefer Georgia to receive a 90% match to make sure that we're getting the most bang for our buck or getting the most people covered for, you know, a smaller amount of money. Laura, anything? Um, yeah, I'll just add to, there was an increase. It was additionally or originally in the governor's budget, a million dollars for the consultant and it went up to 1.6 million. And that I think was to account for the fact that with the 1332 waiver, you do need some actuarial studies. You have to have actuaries look at the risk within, since you're looking at private insurance markets, on the 1332 waiver, um, analyzing the risk to able to set the right rates. And so that's typically a lengthier process that requires some technical expertise. Um, but around the 1115 waiver, I think we do have some evidence from other states that's already been compiled. Um, so that may not be as heavy of a lift for the consultants, but I think they probably just want to see some of those options and understand what some of those effects could be. And we'll see if they spend all the dollars, um, but that's the max that's been proposed to be spent. Yeah, uh, I received a question through a text message actually, so thank <laughs> you for that. Uh, asking uh, if Jordan for a Healthy Future will be sponsoring another Cover Georgia event so that consumers can get a, talk, a chance to talk to your representatives. So we do this every year during the legislative session. We take people uh, to the ropes to actually go speak to their legislators there. While we don't have plans to do that while session is off, we are always available to you to make sure that you can get in touch with your legislators. Uh, so if you can contact us, you can contact your legislators directly, but we are here to help you. Uh, just let us know what questions you might have for them and uh, we can make sure to get you in touch and get make sure you have the right information going into those meetings. All right, anything else? But we will hang around for another minute or so if anyone has any additional questions. Uh, again, the slides and the power and the presentation will be available here on Facebook. So if you missed part or any of our presentation, you can just tune into our saved videos and take a look. All right, well, we will be available to answer questions that you might leave in the comments later on. This video will be available on Georgians for Healthy Futures Facebook page. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. And for those of you who may watch this later, we will make sure to send this out through our email list, through our social media channels as well. So if you missed it or if you have friends and family that would benefit from watching this, please share that in today, in the future. And as always, our contact information is available here. Please reach out with any questions that you might have. Thanks, have a great day.